Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at lionroxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream episode of In the Trenches. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening, folks? Thank you for joining us. Thanks for being into our live chat, which we have on the YouTube official channel, which is Ryan Roxy official. If you'd like to get in on the live chat so you can uh, talk amongst yourselves while we do the show, uh, just get in there right now. Hit that subscribe button and you will be notified when all we do all these uh, live stream shows. If you are listening to us on an audio broadcast, which is Apple, Spotify, or the platform of your choice, thank you very much. But we'd like you for you to get over to our YouTube official channel. So there you go. That's all my business out of the way. We have a big one today, folks. You know, I get happy when we got alumni on the show and um, friends on the show, fellow guitarists on the show. Um, but I have a little speech first. You know that. You love it. Maybe you don't love it, but I want to say it anyway. Um, welcome to In the Trenches. And when I started this podcast, In the Trenches, I was initially describing my own experience in the world of rock and roll. You know, I've always said that I've played in about 100 bands, two of them that you may have heard of. And realizing that a lot of the guests that we have have been on a similar journey, you know, all of them with their unique and inspiring story to tell. So our today's guest, I can consider sort of one of those true rock and roll survivors and a friend that I've had in the trenches for many, many years. Here to talk about those 100 bands or so, plus the latest Night Ranger album release, of which he has been a long-term member of, would you welcome into the trenches fellow guitarist, friend, and rock and roll survivor, Carrie Kelly. Hello, Carrie. All right. Hey, what's up, Ryan? It's great to be here with you. What's going down, friend? <laughs> it's a beautiful day here in Southern California, I got to tell you that. Every day is a beautiful day down in Southern California. It's the best. You know, you have always been the L.A. guy. And, and it's cool because the, la the last couple of weeks we've been going coast to coast. Um, a couple of weeks ago we had, I think, a, f uh, a former band member of yours. We had Rachel Bowen from, uh, from yeah. Slaughter. Did you ever play in the lineup Get with Rachel Bowen? Get a row, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, That's I, just one of them. 99 oh. to go, folks. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll run them all down. Well, we have, he's living in Nashville now. And yeah. uh, so I'd say that's like the Midwest. And then we were uh, East Coast uh, last week with Bridget West, even though her name's West, we were on the East Coast because she's from the yeah. New York Loose. Yep. And uh, we're going back to LA, going back to Cali because this is the California kid, Carrie Kelly with us today. <laughs> What's happening? And you're yeah. playing right now in a in a true, true California band, Night Ranger. Absolutely. I mean, they are like almost quintessential. You know, San Francisco. It's kind of like that. Whole, Bay you know, Area rock. I love it, dude. Night I Ranger. remember when Dawn Patrol came out when it was released, you know, and I was I was living up in the Bay Area. Yeah. That's where I'm from. Um, and it's like. You definitely play all those same songs with the same spirit. And and you have most of the band that's intact, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, we got Jack obviously singing, Brad Gillis obviously with me on guitar and, and Kelly on drums. You know what I mean? So the I mean the core is there, you know. It's awesome. It's so great playing with the guys. And they love playing, you know. As me and you know, like some bands, especially they've been around for a long time, heritage bands or legacy or whatever the fuck they're called, you know, these days. You know, I don't like this guy or I, that guy doesn't like this, you know, the other dude or they don't get along. But these guys love playing. They love uh, creating new music. I mean, there's a new record every few years. And, and I think it's awesome. So happy to be a part of it. Well, that's the thing we're going to talk about in a little bit. We're going to talk about the new album that's, that's getting released. The new single, I think it's called Breakout or Breakthrough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's coming. That's already out there. Yes. But the actual album gets dropped when? This coming Friday or yeah. whenever you're watching this, it's it might be out there already. But the, uh Friday this, the sixth, man, coming in a couple of days. There you go. And it's called And the Band Played On. So we're gonna talk about Night Ranger, of course, but you know what? This podcast, this episode, it's all about you, Carrie Kelly. So <laughs> out of the gate, let's go back to get forward with Carrie mm. Kelly.
We got to have sound effects. I like so it. We do. <laughs> <laughs> it. Definitely, it makes you know it makes everything better. Oh man! So the best way to just sort of describe things from your perspective is that you've always lived in Southern California. You, uh, there's a lot of musicians that go, you know, here and there, you know, go move across uh, to the to the East Coast and vice versa. Yeah, you've always been. Uh, sort of Orange County based. Even when I met you, yeah. And I guess my question is, you, how the fuck do you handle that drive <laughs> when you played in a Hollywood band driving every day from Orange County to L.A. Man, oh dude, it, yeah, it's a fucking nightmare. But uh, well, you know, <laughs> we can get into everything. But you know what the worst was, and I know you know this. You know, from your experience, was dude the Slash. Remember, he liked to rehearse Monday through Saturday. <laughs> two o'clock, two o'clock start time. Stop time was anywhere between midnight or five in the morning. You know, yeah. so I was <laughs> the, the two o'clock start time was kind of arbitrary, <laughs> wouldn't you think, man? It would be like the, now we, when you guys were rehearsing, because there you go. Now there's only ninety eight bands to talk yeah. about, but we're, we're and, and that's a special thing because we do have a collection of bands that both you and I have played played with. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. But, but we've only really played together in one of those bands, I believe, and that was Dad's Porno Mac. Yes, 97 yeah, ninety-seven bands left, folks. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the That's, countdown. But th there, hey, there you go. Back in the eighteen hundreds. Wow. Well, <laughs> definitely the nineteen eighty hundreds. The thing is, or maybe that was the nineties. That was definitely nineties. Yeah, yeah, 90s. Nine, nine, late nineties. Like you said, ninety-seven or whatever something. There it is. I That's remember the photo shoot. Right <laughs> who's, we were, the art who's the art director on that one? I don't know. All I know is we were using green screens even back then because <laughs> we were not at the ocean when we did that photo shoot. I can tell you that much. But for those of you that actually, if you can go back to that album cover, that's uh, Carrie Kelly and myself on that album cover. That's the Dad's Porno Mag release. Um, if anybody in the chat, if you're actually really, really up on your rock and roll, um, what is what sort of album cover were we playing homage to? And I'm giving you a real big clue right now. All right, folks. And and actually, this is another thing we're going to talk about. Carrie Kelly owns two bars in Las Vegas or co-owns and is a cooperative of, of two bars, Aces and Ales. And yeah. so I the crowd knows, the folks know that are in the chat and that watch us uh, weekly. Uh, I normally do not drink uh, anything but uh, this white sort of skinny bitch water. Which is basically, you know, it's basically, you know, vodka and soda. Yeah. But uh, today I've I've gone off course a little bit in spirit of you of Aces and Ales. I love so, it. So um, going back to get forward, back to L.A. And yeah, that that uh, slash rehearsal time drive. You drive and you, like I said, you've always lived Orange County. What time would you have to leave to get to rehearsal with Slash? And then what time would you actually get home? Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, on that thing. Well, of course, I had to pick Rod up, the singer. Remember, he had no car or anything. So I'd leave at like noon, go to Rod's house, fight traffic the whole way, get him, then obviously go to Slash's. Like you said, get there by two. We're all there. Nothing's happening but Adam Day, of course. And then uh, wait for Adam Slash. Day is Slash's is, is tech. Yeah. Is he is he Slash's tech to this day, I think? No, I, I was... With Morning. Adam about six months ago, and he said he wasn't with him anymore. Over, I was okay. over at May, so I don't know. I think he's working with Neil again. With Sean. Neil Sean from Journey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, see, we're gonna we're gonna drop a lot of names, folks, and I do drop the name Mates Rehearsal because that's where a lot of stuff went down for all of our careers. I mean, yeah. I, that's where I did my Alice Cooper audition. Um, that shady character named Bobby that owns it. Uh, it's, 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 it's sort of where we met and uh, are still friends to this day with Mike, the sack Fasano. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, Mates Rehearsal is just one of those places that I think every band, how many bands have you had go through there? Basically every band, as you know, and, you know, <laughs> from the top to the bottom. But yeah, no, Mates is just like the the stalwart. You know what I mean? It's it, it's the place, and I love it. Shade Bobby, dude. <laughs> we need to get Bobby. Let's call him up. 
<laughs> well, that's that's part of what it's in some sort of bio. I think it was in the the latest. We we have a sponsor, Buyer Dynamic. They're very good mics, by the way, and headphones. But uh, one of our sponsors uh, put it in their bio that a shady character from a rehearsal studio from called Mates put in a good word for Ryan Roxy and that's how he got into Alice Cooper. So that's the story it. we're going with, folks. I love it. Had nothing, I love it. <laughs> nothing to do with my plane. It yeah. was this just a sh slim shady Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> that's so I want to talk a little bit about uh your earlier uh influences because you know you grew up I guess we'll just go right to the chart because you know and tell me if there was any bands before this, because we have this very special chart that you kind of oh, see. It almost sure. looks like a medical chart yeah. of all the bands that you've sort of, and these are not even close to all of the bands. I really want to thank the Dave Rattenberry for putting wow. this together, the rat. And he put it together in sort of a chronological order. So the first one that I see on the list is uh, Big Bang Babies. But there was, was there bands before that? Yeah, I, I was, uh, I mean, they didn't really make that big of an impact, but I was in a band called Empire, and uh, it was kind of like a half Orange County, half LA based. So obviously, I was from Orange County and the bass player, um, and that was 80s, 87 and, and 88. Um, I was such a, I was like a little kid. It was like I was only like 16, 17 years old. So again, I was driving back and forth to LA and stuff. But uh, that was like kind of like the first band, but it didn't really make much noise. And then uh, Big Bang was kind of like was my band that I put together and kind of did the whole LA thing, you know, five years too late. But uh, you know, like I said, I was just too, I was just too young, you know, I, I mean, literally, like I said, in those 87, 88, 89, I was just a little kid, you know, so. But you were going for it on a very big level, especially, yeah. and it's always been like with stage production and stuff. Cause I remember big, big bang babies had ramps and ego, you know, solo, uh, yeah. Spotlights and is that one of the first shots that you guys did? Yeah, <laughs> great. As you see, so that was a uh, the band. We kind of got involved with all these, you know, more shady characters, all involved <laughs> uh, with Kiss. So we had like Kim Fowley was in the mix. Oh boy, Billa, Co Billa Coin and Kenny Kerner. So it was like a Kiss reunion, all trying wow. to help us and stuff. Yeah, oh look at that. There we are. That was our romantics uh, period. We need to have outfits. Uh, matching matching red pleather yeah i love it and, but, you're, and but you're right but we, we did have the production shit, you know uh, all my cousins helped us out you know they, they were a little bit older and they would build yeah we had the ramps and we had the big like, kiss bbb lights like no joke <laughs> we had fucking bombs dude my cousin would like bomb like com literally i mean we would be in jail if we did it these days <laughs> and yeah definitely if you if you did it today the yeah. baby Go back to that photo, Vic, if you can, real quick. It says the Baby Bangers Fair Fan Club, <laughs> it, and that was located on La Cienega, so far from Orange County. Yeah. Um, for all for all you can swallow, call us. Wow. I, I, <laughs> Wait a I, second. I, yeah, we, we would be canceled if we came out with that right now. I think you might, but um, the thing is. <laughs> visual all you can swallow folks this is a, if, if, if this doesn't give you if you're listening to us on in your car right now pull over and get onto uh, youtube and you can watch um all these killer old posters and killer stories that we're talking with carrie kelly right now uh one of the one of the hairstyles that you've kind of kept consistent throughout is the half and half sort of uh there the, when i was growing up there was a doll called tiffany taylor and you could, if you turned her head one way, she was a brunette. Then you, then you twisted the top of her head the other way. It was, she was a blonde. Uh, Vic, do you have a picture of Tiffany Taylor right now? You don't, he, he's saying that he doesn't. But, but you know, Tiffany Taylor, where was the inspiration behind half and half? Or did you just, could you only afford half peroxide? Yeah, that was pretty much it. You know, it was, <laughs> it was just something that me and another guy did, or we had the, an idea for it. And, uh, and then I just kept doing it during those days. But I think I, after Big Bang, I don't think I had that anymore, but I still kind of have some of the white 
crap in there. Yeah, I, I've done the white patch because that was a Joe Perry sort of takeoff. Yeah. I think I think yeah. even back in the day, Slash had the had the off colored uh, bleached sort of patch. You know, I I, I, I want to say it was joe perry that was the originator of it but who knows maybe it what maybe it goes back in the lineage maybe it goes even farther back maybe it was a johnny thunders thing yeah and i think keith had it had it keith, of that. course keith had it you're right you're right 70s. yeah 71 yeah. two kind of so yeah so that's why we get it's all this all the same shit yeah. The Godfather of the blonde patch is keith yeah. Richards. How, how did i not know that one and by the way uh for those of you that are keeping score at home, that uh, Dad's Porto Mag album cover in the back drop, that was our tribute to the Black and Blue record. So yeah. did anyone get that? I didn't notice. Did, uh, did Vic somebody, it, it came up. Somebody had it. Yeah. It did. Okay. Cool. 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 <laughs> well, there hey, there's Tiffany Taylor. I love it. <laughs> Vic's, Vic's a good producer, man. He's great. Even though you saw the cat fight between, before the show, you got to see a little backstage action. Yeah. I love it. Me and me and Vic arguing about audio levels. I love it. So um, on. Well, let's go back to let's go back to that list real quick. And I told Vic I'd be I'd be uh, hitting that uh, band list a few times oh, um, because after that, you don't talk so much about at least the research I did on uh, the web and stuff is uh, about Pretty Boy Floyd. But were you more or less helping them out throughout the years, or have you? I mean, because it says that you were involved with them off and on for for a while. Yeah, it was, it was kind of a back and forth kind of a thing. I mean, it like that early time frame you had on there, like 95, 96, we were actually really trying to do it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, we had a manager and, and trying to do demos. And I think that we were trying to get a deal with that CMC, I think was the name of that label back then. I believe Warrant was on it and some other band. So we were trying to do it during that time. And then I kind of was not in the band when we were playing and doing other bands but yeah, because all- dad's portal mag came right around that same time and we yeah. we were a trio we originally started yeah. as a trio with will efforts and uh mike fasano the great yeah. mike fasano on drums and uh and myself and then we had stefan in on bass and because yes. and then then you came right around that time or did you play with will as well no, no we played with will yeah okay okay so, but yeah around that period so i wasn't really playing with pretty boy floyd too much but they would always call me and I go, hey, can you like that record right there? I only played like five or six guitar solos. They go, hey, we'll pay you to. Can you come down and play some guitar solos? I go, OK, cool. I'll, I'll do it. You know, and then it's like, hey, can you do the photo shoot with, you know, roping me in every time? You know, it's kind of yeah, like, almost like, you're, hey, what, dude, now you're in time, the band. <laughs> yeah. At one time, I swear to God, this is a true story, dude. I was getting gas, dude, in Orange County, going to the sushi, going to a sushi restaurant my buddy owns in Newport Beach. And Chris, the guitar player, calls me. I'm getting gas in the car. I go, hey, yeah, what's going on, man? He goes, hey, can dude, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta help me out. You gotta help, dude. The guys are going to Japan. I can't go. Can, I, he go, he goes, he can, can, you, can, you, Japan. Japan. can you play? And I go, when? I swear to God. He goes, tomorrow. You've got to fly out. I, I'll get you the flight right now. And this and that tomorrow, dude. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was going to a sushi place. It was so like ironic, but. Uh, so yeah, they kept roping me in. Like, hey, we'll pay you. I, okay, okay, I'll do it. You know, but you've Just always been really good with that. I don't know why. <laughs> all of a sudden, we have an echo. Um, is that my echo or is that your echo? Yeah, it's gone now. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, wow. I, I know, maybe maybe Thank I'm you, too, too nice of a guy. You know? Hey, can you do this? Okay, I'll do it. Hey, can you do this? All right, I'll do it. Now, you've always been really good at learning stuff on the fly. I mean, I think when you came up to audition for uh, Dad's Porno Mag, you knew the set. I, I think I even said something. I, said, I go, I think you know the album better than we do at this point. And, I, and, and that's kind of like, that's your secret superpower. Is that yeah. you learn this stuff. And, and over, the more bands that you get into, does, it, does that just become, you know, okay, that's what I need to do. Or how do you approach, because because a lot of bands come, like you just said, you know, this band led into this band, which led into this band. Um, how do you approach getting into a new band and what sort of advice and inspirational? It's always, I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I think I, I have a pretty good musical memory. I, you know, I can retain stuff pretty good, but uh, 
it seems like, especially in those early days, like, I mean, I would just really work hard to be, to begin with. Some people are like just mediocre. Oh, I'll get by or I'll do this a little bit of that. I'll just go all the way. And I was all, seems like I've been the guy that, you know, if somebody needs somebody, it's like, like I said, it's like that tomorrow or the next day. And then, so I got to learn 15 or 17 or whatever songs. And I, I just do it, man. I just apply myself and work really hard. And, uh, and that's it, man. Well, did, I mean, did I, you, I know. did you study when you were early on, did you study classical? Did you have teachers or was everything self-taught? How did it, how did this memory become, or were you just always ear training? How did you get this knack for learning, for learning so much, you know, material yeah. in such a short amount of time? Well, when I, when I was, I think around 11 years old, I started taking lessons. You know, my mom went down to guitar center and goes, I need this kid needs to learn. What does he do? And you know, I'm in like fifth grade or whatever. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And, uh, Oh, look at there's HB right there, dude. It's my stomping there it grounds. The pier. Love it. And, uh, Love it. So, so I took lessons from this jazz guitar player, um, private lessons, like at his house, you know, he had like a studio in his garage and, uh, you know, I was like, what the fuck is this? I want to play like Unchained by Van Halen. He's like, no, we got to learn the modes and this and that, whatever, you know, he was into like Al Miola and, uh, you know, Larry Carlton and all these great players that, that I love now. But when you're a kid, you know, you want to, you know, Jamie's crying or running with the devil. Um, but anything, really anything off of Van Halen one to up to uh, up up to basically uh, fair warning. I would yeah. say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but that really helped me get you know get my mind around more playing. You know, I mean, really learning modes and scales and the whole nine yards. But uh, after that point, I probably took lessons from him for a, about a year, maybe or less. I can't remember exactly. Then I kind of just did it on my own, dude, just like fucking scratching the record and remember that and the, the tape and oh my God, yeah, it was a nightmare. Yeah. But then somebody got me hip to back in the, so this is whatever time, I don't know, 83 or 84, whatever, that you can get a reel to reel tape deck. And I got one, I get a garage sale or something and you record what you want on it. Like Michael Sanker, I was really into Sanker at regular speed. And then you could Sanker. turn it down, dude, from 30 ips to 15. So it's half speed. And but then would, that, but that would change it, but that would obviously change the tuning. So you'd have to tune your guitar down as well, right? No, it, it's exactly the same. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's the same speed. pitch. Yes. Okay. But half speed. So then when you got all these guys like Shanker or Uli Roth and people that I was into around that time, or even Al Di Miola, and that was around the same time Ingve was coming up, you know, the shit, especially when you're like a 13 year old kid, you, you know, you don't know what it's hard to get your head around it, but half speed, it was like, this is great. So, you know, back then when, when I was around that that period, like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, I would just play guitar most of the day. I mean, it's that same old bullshit, the five, six, seven hours. You know, eventually my mom, which my dad was fucking pissed, dude, but in 10th grade, my mom just said, you don't have to go to school. Really? I'm, I'm not kidding you. Yes. I mean, I, I, your mom, I remember her. God rest her soul. I, I know we've we've had a rough couple of years, man. And uh, yeah. uh, both of us. The thing is, I remember always be, her being so supportive. But it sounds like both your parents were supportive as well. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, are. they were. I think my dad, like I said, in the beginning, because he, he was always, uh, you know, and, and this is another thing I, I think I learned from him. You know, he worked at the same place. He worked in the grocery industry. 40 plus years, dude, he would work six days a week, never missed like, four o'clock in the morning, get home at like four. I mean, just like religious. So, I mean, it, that's what I grew up with. So it, just that work ethic, you know, so that, I think routine, it me, that work ethic. I, it, yeah. It just instilled in me. I did, didn't know any different in a way, you but know? you figured out the tape deck, uh, slowing it down. Uh, <laughs> that's a major thing at that yeah. time. Yeah. Now it's, now it's you just go onto YouTube and you go onto that little wheel and you can go at 75% speed or 50% yeah. speed. Trust me, when I'm when I'm preparing for an Alice Cooper tour these days, I go and I check out some kid that's probably learned the part better than I have or better than the original. And, and then I just and, and then I can slow it down and I go, oh, okay, now I can make it my own. So yeah, that, that little that little tool on uh, the uh, YouTube 
settings wheel really helps out because it keeps everything at the same tuning too as well. Yeah, I mean the tools that kids have these days, I mean it's it's unbelievable. I I think it's it's great, you know, cuz like we said we were doing well I figured that tape deck thing out. I think somebody had told me about it. I was like, "What? What do you mean? Go get a t- fucking reel to reel." But uh, you know, we're scratching the records all day and trying to get the shit what's di- I ain't right. Fuck. It was a nightmare, you know. <laughs> but you had to dedicate, you know, yourself to it. So you know, I tried my best. And another cool thing about we moved from Huntington Beach to Irvine um, in the early 80s d- during that period, like I was 11 or 12 years old or whatever. And the guy who lived down the street from me a few houses down was Joey, uh, the guitar, Joey Allen, the guitar player from Warrant. Warrant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, did you know him during that time or did, did was it yeah. years later? No, no, no. I, I knew him. You know, he's like, I don't know exactly, like maybe five years older than me or something like that. So I was like 12 years old or whatever. His band, the, the, the bus would drop me off like right in front of his house, The you know, like going to school. And so he was like, whatever, I don't know, 17 or 18. And his band would rehearse in the, in the garage. So then like I get off of school, I'd be walking by, knock on the garage door. You know, they open the garage, <laughs> come in. I'm like sitting there and we talk about it. He busts my balls like all the time whenever we play with them. Now, let me ask you this. When you did actually uh, join Warrant, whose uh, position were you playing with? Was it Eric or oh, Joey's? Joey. But, oh, so you actually... <laughs> So all no. those little parts that you, you no, were listening to, yeah. it all came back around. Yeah, yeah there, there's there's a there's a, a lineup of uh, Warrant with yeah, Carrie in it and Mike, uh, Mike Fasano, right? Yeah, and I know that you and uh, Janie were really tight, you know. And again, it was um, a heartbreaking story and stuff like that. But you, I know at the at the time, you guys were recording stuff together, right? Yeah. In the end, did. The, did that other did, did those tracks ever see the light of day? What happened with with the tracks that you were recording with with Janie before he passed? Yeah, um, no, I mean, we yeah we had a great relationship and and worked really easy together. He would come and stay here at that at the house, you know, and we'd work for two or three days or whatever. Um, you know, his solo album, me and him did that together. We didn't know if it was going to be a warrant or what was going to happen, but yeah, right around the you know, the end, unfortunately, we were working on stuff for a, about a year and there's a bunch of tracks. I don't know exactly how many, like 15 or 18 or there that are in various stages of completion. Right. Some are just us jamming on acoustic and him kind of riffing. Some are almost done. I don't really know what to do with them, to be honest. I know that they did get a hold of me a couple of years ago asking about putting something together with the estate and stuff. And then it just I never heard anything. Well, it, maybe so someday I, we'll 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 see they'll see the light of day, and I know uh, yeah. whatever you do with it, you'll do it with like utmost respect, and you'll you'll put all that work that's into that studio. We're talking, you know, before the uh, before we went on live, uh, we were talking about Carrie's studio that he's in. I've actually recorded some stuff there with you, yeah. Carrie, before. Um, yeah. One of the songs that we recorded together during that DPM Dad's Porno Mag era. Uh, I was just talking about Jerry Finn last oh. week with Bridget West because uh, he mixed the New York Loose album. And uh, for those of you that listened uh, and watched the last week's episode with Bridget, I uh, was talking about uh, what a great producer, what a great guy uh, oh, yeah. Jer- Jerry was. He, he yeah. mixed Green Day, completely responsible, I, I think, Absolutely. between him and Mike Fasano, responsible for a lot of this uh, Blink-182, that sort of Southern California sound, yep. wouldn't you yep. say? He, um, he, actually, whenever I hear those songs come on the radio, I mean, I, I think of him. He was he was a great guy. I think he treated us fucking awesome, and, and but he was he was great, and he had that ear. You know, but we were awesome. remember us being at Conway. I mean, it's it's to be honest with you, it, it was a little fuzzy for me because that whole that whole experience was very fuzzy. It was more than just aces and ales, and it was more than just vodka <laughs> skinny bitches that I was drinking. Um, but we recorded a song called Well, obviously the song title will tell it all. We recorded a song of yours called Tweaked. Yeah. <laughs> and and it just so happens that I, you know, I I love that song. I remember that song. Um, didn't we had we had another uh, engineer slash producer Redcoat. Red <laughs> Red <coat. laughs> How do we know it was Redcoat? That's all we know. 
Yeah. Sean O'Dwyer. Red Sean coat. O'Dwyer. I, I, yeah. I, we have names for everybody. I love it. I call it, dude, I, <laughs> still to this day, I think it's so great. Who Finn is Red Coat. Uh, Red Coat. I, that was a game, but now I heard that that song made it onto another album that you had released because I was listening to uh, uh, some sort of you know when I start doing research on these podcasts I start going down these rabbit holes I listen to some uh, crazy Italian podcast and he was talking to uh, a manager of um, Jerry G Spot. He was doing oh. it, and he was, and and the interviewer was asking him because he was apparently managing B- Big Bang Babies. He was asking about this song, but he was saying "To Weeked," "To Weeked." I love the song "To Weeked," and it was like, no, <laughs> tweaked. I think he's talking tweaked. about. Yeah. So yeah, the, yeah. Where, where did that song end up, and when did it come out, or how many versions of it came out? Uh, well, I think I had a demo of it, obviously, before we did it, and then we did that really great version. Um, but but it didn't, really, it didn't come out on anything after that But but it, as that song. But Stephen Piercy, believe it or not, cut a version of it, and he but he changed some of the words and stuff, but called it Freak instead okay. of Tweet, Freak. But okay. so it's, I think it's about 75% the same, you know? Steven is so funny, dude, because I would just give him riffs sometimes that were just like, here's just a, like a weirdo riff, like a one minute riff. He would just like loop it and make a song out of it and put it on his record. I'm like, <laughs> now, what? was this Steven Piercy solo or was this Steven Piercy with Rat or did you play in both versions? Uh, no, this was, he did it on one of his solo records, you know, okay. just like later on. I don't know exactly when. I think it was in the 2000s or something like that. But, uh, we got to go yeah. back to the list, Vic. You got to keep me because uh, I, I, there's so many bands. Like I said, we're I think we're down to the low 90s right now. Is is the Rat in there? See, I, I don't see Rat on the. Oh yeah, Rat was on the list. There it is. Now, what lineup? And it's kind of going in chronological order because we've talking about. Uh, oh, yeah, there man. it is, the lineup with Robbie Crane with the Blots, of course, yeah, blots. and uh, Warren D. Martini. Now, was it you that? I ended up in some weird acid trip in Lake Havasu. <laughs> well, Probably. There, there we were. <laughs> <laughs> Where does that come from? I love that. Somebody sent it to me. Is is that a MAGA I, I, artwork? I, yeah. I was digging through shit, like, you know, looking for photos and old stuff. And I found that. I go, look at this fucking thing. Wow. That's great. You, well, you guys were definitely into Veet. Before it was a thing now, because hair removal was, it looked very nice and clean and, and just completely yeah, like a dolphin's back. I we're love that. Yeah. <laughs> For yeah, those of you listening to our audio podcast, you have no idea what we're doing. You got to get on our Ryan Roxy official channel so you can see all these amazing photos and uh, maybe some not so amazing illustrations that Vic is putting up on yeah. our episode here. I, I got I got to go back for a second. Remember that. So the Conway, I think you might have left. You had to go home, but uh, we. <laughs> yeah, I think I just so sober up. <laughs> we we were still rewind. there. Remember, I can't remember uh, the sax chick's name right now. Charlene, was that it? I think. Yeah, she didn't. She uh, managed the studio. Yeah, dude. So we were still there when she came into work the next day at like <laughs> nine a.m. Tweaked. <laughs> it's the name of the song, folks. <laughs> she came in and she goes. What she goes? What the fuck are you guys doing here? You've got to go, man! And, and I'm like, holy yeah. shit! Because I think we were actually tr- we were uh, recording it on the on the sort of on the side. We were yeah. kind of like doing it a little bit on the downtime when when, yeah. when the uh, a studio wasn't officially booked. And Jerry was kind enough to like yeah. say, you know what, I'll hang out with you. And Red Coat was there. You know, he was having fun too. We were all having fun. Was was. Was Bobo there at that at those sessions or not? <laughs> he might have been. He must have been. I'm sure at one point or another. Good old Bobo. Well, for those of you that don't know who Bobo is, he's 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 an episode all into himself. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh-huh. He really. <laughs> so we're catching up with Gary. We are eventually going to get to the new album, the new Night Ranger album, folks. That is is dropping. I, I Friday. Hate saying, yeah, it's dropping Friday, and it's uh, called and the band played on. Uh, the first single is already out there right now, um, and you can check that out on YouTube or any of the uh, you know Night yeah. Ranger platforms they have. Because Carrie, you don't usually do social media; you kind of shy away from it, right? Yeah, I, I don't have really 
anything. Yeah. Um, it's I have somebody, Mary, who helps me in Europe, you know, fan page type stuff, which is awesome. Uh, she's great. But uh, yeah, I don't really just get on it. I don't know. I, I just, to be honest with you, I just have too much other shit going on. I mean, I love it. People are into it, you know, like Twitter. Oh my God, I woke up today. It's beautiful. Uh, 10 minutes later, I'm getting Starbucks. This is the best fucking thing ever. I'm just like, Dude, I've got a conference call I got to do. Aces, you know, we have 50 employees at Aces. I mean, it's always something happening. I then you got the band, or then we're traveling, and just I don't know. I just don't do it. <laughs> now you know what? That's a good segue for us to sort of come come back. We'll come back to rock and roll in a second, but I want to hear about what started. Uh, what was the inspiration behind starting Aces Nails? Because I've, I always figured you you for starting a sushi joint because you and Fasano, when you played, especially with dad's porno, Mac, I think you actually turned Mike on to sushi or he turned you on to, or somehow you guys had a love affair with sushi. Yes. And uh, you're going to find out about that love affair right after we take this small, quick little break. Cause we're hanging out with a uh, guitarist, Carrie Kelly. Uh, we're, we're down about to like 80 more bands to talk about. That's all we're, we we're, we're working down the list. <laughs> we'll hit them all dude, to get some good stories in, man. And I, and I mentioned uh, our sponsor, Biodynamic. So why don't we have a little commercial with Biodynamic now and we will come back with part two where you guys get to be part of it. Hello, folks. Roxy here. Hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. I'm very excited today to announce our newest sponsor, Biodynamic. They produce some of the industry's very best quality microphones and headphones. And that's why they're the perfect fit right here in the trenches. You're hearing my voice today through the great TG V70 microphone. This mic is perfect for any home studio, plus I get to use it on stage. I have paired the mic with the legendary Biodynamic Studio headphones, and they're called the DT770 Pros. These are amazing for analytical listening, truly the most authentic sound experience I've ever had. So whether it's listening to a podcast or one of your favorite albums, I definitely recommend these. Treat yourself right with Biodynamic Gear, the gold standard in high fidelity. Now, let's get back to the podcast. There you go, Carrie. See, that was my other studio. That's my like other it. studio that I have. Same reading glasses, but just yeah. a whole nother studio. <laughs> yeah, that looked like it was like more of the guitar room, even though you do have some guitars. Uh, You're in the drum room kind of right now. That was more so, of the yeah. guitar room, it looked more like. More the vibe room. Yeah. So let's talk about the love affair with sushi first and then how it translated and turned over to a business enterprise with Aces and Ales. But where did the sort of crush for sushi happened when did well, it happen yeah Was so, it you or mike yeah are you with me um, yeah i'm with you so 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 this same thing kind of like a huntington beach thing i met this guitar player uh guy named kurt james he was like kind of a famous dude around orange county he real quick to touch on him so ingve had that band called or was in that band called steeler with ron keel or whatever ingve left the band then this guy, Kurt James, was his replacement for like, I think, like a year and a half or something like that. So he was like this OC legend guitar player guy. Then he was actually in Striper for a little bit, too. They, it's a very odd story. They apparently got rid of Oz before the Soldiers Under Command, I think, record. And they had this, my friend in the band, the Kurt James guy. And then uh, then they up firing him and getting Oz back. Anyway, I was lucky enough to meet this guy and started hanging out with him and, and whatever. How he old was, were you at the time? Uh, like... 15 ish around that whole kind of period. You're um, networking all the time, dude. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, yeah. I met this guy I go, I got to hang out with him. So I was kind of like, to be honest with you. And I, and I love the guy to this day. He was like a, a mentor to me because like I said, he was friends with Ingve, all this shit, you know, he did the Mike Varney records and all this kind of bullshit. And again, he was like five years older than me. I would kind of would just was help him and hang out at his house or we go out to eat or I just like watch him record. So it, it really, you know, you, when you see somebody who's that great and you're kind of just trying to do it, it's almost like osmosis. It really helps. So make a long no. story short, he was in that whole guitar fucking thing. He had this Japanese lady taking him to Japan, a promoter. And so I was kind of like this kid just hanging out. And they're like, Look, we're going to go to this sushi place in Newport Beach. And my friend actually ended up owning it uh, called California Beach Sushi. So that's kind of how I was just introduced to it. It was from this Japanese lady who was a promote doing guitar promotions uh, with people 
like on so that's the, that's the that's the mystery solved you yes. definitely turned mike fasano on to sushi i guess probably or got him yeah. more into it or something or so got him more into that. it because that's that yeah okay so the thing was at that point I really hadn't had much sushi at all in my whole entire. I wasn't really into it at all. The only the guy that turned me on to it was the bass player of the Scorpions, oh, was yeah. Ralph. Yeah, and that, and that was the the first tour I did with with Alice ever it was in '96, and we uh, we did a, a co headline thing with with the Scorpions. And I remember Ralph. He said, "You got to try this." And I said, well, what is it? He says, it's a California roll. It's the most wimpiest piece of sushi you'll ever have. But Gil and I said, well, let me try it. It looks like cucumber. I don't like cucumber. <laughs> and, then, and, I, and then I tried it, and I, I did end up liking it. But yeah. I never got to the level that you and Mike was on. I, didn't you guys call yourselves the Sushi Twins at one yeah, point? Yeah, man. Oh, we love it. It's, it, it, it. it's. I just had sushi on Sunday. When we, I mean, it's my favorite food still to this day. And speaking of which, uh, we actually are – talking about doing a sushi restaurant here craft beer and sushi in orange county so and it's with the, the lady actually this her name is miko the same promoter lady the same lady that turned you on to sushi from the beginning yes wow man. that is a story all right well let's let's you know what i i'm, I'm already sensing especially from from the comments in the chat that there's going to have to be a part two there's just too many bands there's too many stories to talk about <laughs> and uh you know i don't get to catch up with you near enough I you know. know, so so I'm I'm finding out shit that I didn't know about. Um, I do <laughs> want to find out about of uh, aces and ales and oh, where yeah. the inspiration came for that, and uh, you know what year it is, who's your partners, and uh, how did this whole thing come about? Aces, yeah. And ales. So so we've had aces and ales. We have two locations. Um, we started like 13 years ago, or a little bit more than 13 years ago, and how that came about was um, some of my buddies down in San Diego that. This is a kind of a weird story. Ryan, you know that place called Downtown Rehearsal? You know, like the five-story building in downtown that everybody rehearses at? Not anymore, no. We're, we're, we're downtown LA? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no. Because I, I was always... If if it was it was either it was either mates or then if you went it was that place on like Hollywood and Selma or you know yeah. like or, oh, or, or Highland and okay. Selma yeah. and... Yeah, that, well, this this joint called Downtown Rehearsal is still there. It's like five. Or Phil stores. Kemmel's place, or Phil Kennel's place, or whatever, whatever the place. Yeah. So, well, so, so yeah, you it's had, the old days in the nineties. So Big Bang used to rehearse there. You know, you rent a room and it's a monthly thing. The guy who owns that building, his name is Greg Cook. So I met him then, uh, and he ended up being a big craft beer guy. He owns this company called Stone Brewing. They're like one of the biggest. Like San Diego, they started in ninety six. Um, and so basically, I've kind of been into the craft beer thing for a couple of decades. Um, love it. And, you know, he's helped me a lot, kind of mentored me in, in, in that as well. Vegas, back then, 13, 14 years ago, it's so strange. You know, Vegas, you can get anything, you know, the hookers, the, you know, blow, the sushi. <laughs> hookers and blow. <laughs> from, 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 you get sushi from Japan like that day. But like 13, 14 years ago, there was like no craft beer out there. So there was did like you ever a play? Of, did you ever play with Dizzy Reed and hookers and blow? Did you ever do a hookers and blow gig? Not not in the band, but we did some other jams, you know. Okay. Before. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I know the whole the Hillary thing. Duffers. Or the Hillary, I, I played one. I played one or two shows with uh, with uh, Dizzy as well. You yeah. know, I think we, 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 I mean, you might have come out with us on that on that trip as well. But a bunch of golf. Yeah, there are all these bands that happen within the band and stuff like that. Yeah. But go back. I digress. Go back to Las Vegas. What the inspiration? You could find anything, but you couldn't find a craft beer place. Yeah, yeah, which was very strange. So then, uh, me and my partner Ryan Johnson. Um, said, hey, let's try to find a, a venue to, you know, a location to start a craft beer place. And it took us about six or nine months to find it. And you got to get the lease and you got to get a gaming license because we have gaming as well. Uh, but we finally did it. Like I said, we've been open for about 13 and a half years, opened a second location, and now we're building a third location. And and that's a, it's a- 10, All in the Vegas area? Yeah, Las Vegas, yeah. The new okay. one's awesome, dude. It's like 10,000 square foot. They're just building it right now. It's going to have a brewery whole nine yards and everything we do there's great it's scratch food everything's made from scratch we have no freezers we're not doing any of that bullshit so everything is made fresh daily um wow. you know 50 craft drafts you know what i mean it's a very dangerous place to be yeah, especially but, when you know when you know the owner 
I'm gonna get I'm gonna get into that in a little bit because there are some questions that we have a segment called Let the People Speak, but that's coming very soon, folks. I know that a lot of people contributed questions, and I have enough questions. Again, I want to thank uh, the Rat Dave Rattenberry for oh, yeah. helping me with a lot of putting this uh, script together to this week. Um, he's giving time. me a lot of bullet points, but there's again it's just so much to talk about. Um, the, the the first aces and nails. I remember. Uh, you were playing with Alice Cooper at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, didn't you have him come down and, and play a gig at, at, at your, at your place? Right. How did dude, that go? What was that story was, about? It was fucking sick, dude. It was, it was so strange. So we were, we were playing for three nights at that or place called the Orleans, you know, the Orleans. I Theater. remember that. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, so the it was hotel like Friday, Saturday, Saturday. Venue. yeah. And uh, dude, by chance, I think it was like on the Friday night, so we just, we, it was totally spur of the moment. Friday night, Bostic, the, our old, you know, monitor oh, guy. Bostic, you, a monitor uh, guy, yeah. Bostic the goes, bear. Hey, man, you should, uh, you should do a big jam. Chief. Do it. Yeah. I, uh, big Chief is what I called him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so he goes, dude, you, you should, uh, do a jam at Aces, man. And I'm like, really? You think so? He goes, yeah, dude, ask Alice. I go, ah, I don't, you know, it's like too much, you know, we're doing three nights in a row, you know, whatever. I go, well, I guess I'll ask him or whatever. And it was on Friday. I go, Alice, hey, what do you think? You want to come down to the Aces and like jam or something? And he goes, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, what? All right. Well, shit. So, <laughs> now, so literally. Did, was it set up for a live show or did you have to get all the equipment in no, there? No, and... we did it all the next day, like Saturday. Or I didn't do it all because I had to do the sound check and all that bullshit. But we built a stage, got the stuff rented fucking gear because you know we didn't all of our gear was obviously at the at the show um and so basically dude it was fucking crazy it was packed there was like 500 people there the cops fucking came we locked the doors dude it was like just it was See, like that was yeah. right right before the time of like when social media when everybody had a camera phone so you, there's probably not a lot of footage of that show yeah i think there's i think there is a little bit but yeah this was like i think this was in uh, 2009, I believe. Um, but dude, it was so crazy. So what, what we did was the regular, like even I think you guys do it. So us, which was DeGrasso and, and Chuck and whatever. Yeah. That was, and, yeah, it was, that, that was the lineup. You had Jimmy DeGrasso, you had Damon Johnson, Ch uh, Chuck Garrick, uh, as well as, uh, of course, Alice. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the main man of the boss, of course. Yeah. But, boss, uh, man. so, so we, we kind of did like, uh, I don't know, five or six songs jam before, you know, the regular shit that, you know, Thin Lizzy and Aerosmith or whatever. And then, dude, we had a car to bring Alice and Shep. Shep was like, what the fuck is going to? It was so crazy. <laughs> so what the hell? This is nuts. And then we just, Alice just literally came in, walked right on stage, started singing. We played like five songs with him. He walked, walked right out. Yeah, yeah. Got back That's in the car did. and fucking boogied. But it's funny, <laughs> after we got done playing the first song, you know, we just had regular monitors, amps are on 10, you know, total, you know, bar gig. Alice goes, man, it's, this is the best we've ever sounded. It sounds great up here. <laughs> I, so after all the Paul, Paul Bostic didn't like that. Cause he was the monitor, man. He's like, <laughs> after all the work I do and the in-ears and everything, this sounds great. No, just, just an amp. Cause it probably took him back to the old club yeah. days of Detroit, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, was, that, it was a throwdown, man. It was like, one for people still talk about it in Vegas because it's, I mean, you know, you don't go to some weirdo bar with an Alice Cooper shows. I mean, it was fucking crazy, man. It was awesome, man. So I, he I, was, I, and that was at the original, uh, location. that was at the original yeah. location. Is that yeah. location still yes. running? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. now, it, and you're expanding and possibly folks, the Easter egg, uh, out there of a, uh, of a actual sushi joint slash craft yeah. beer place. I yeah. I, I mean, are you into, are you into IPAs? Are you into ales? Are you into Hefeweizers? Is it, is it, is it the whole fucking. Uh, yeah. The, the, the whole gamut in general. Yeah. But uh, whole, you know, some days you're into sours. Some days you're into the good old Ippas, you know, or, uh, yeah. you know, and then now they have all the hazies and the juicies and the, this and the, that, you know, but uh, oh, wow. no, I think it's interesting. I think it's fun. And you know, it, it uh, there's so many great companies around well the world these days um producing great ales and i just think it's kind of fun you know 
kind of like sushi in a way, you know, it's where, you know, it's like if if you go out and have a regular steak dinner, it's like you're eating a hundred bites of the same steak, but you go to a sushi place, there's like, you know, the tuna has its taste, yellowtail has its taste, salmon has a different taste, eel has, so it's like, the variety you can have a whole different type of night only doing on the types of sushis that you've had yeah man. yeah so it's fun wow okay folks <laughs> i've been we, asking a lot of we've but, only got to like three bands <laughs> i know i know that it, it definitely tells me that we're gonna have to look at this list folks if you are <laughs> if you haven't seen it and we haven't even brought up uh uh love hate uh adler's appetite uh, you know, you played with Vince Neil as well for many years. And, uh, but fuck, man. I mean, yeah. So we'll definitely have to talk about all those other things if, if when we can come back to it, because it is time right now to get the people <laughs> from the chat involved into our um, podcast right now. This is a little section we call Let the People Speak. <laughs> <laughs> because we are the people's show we're the sheeple's show i guess with that uh little sheep there do you like yeah. that vic you like that That's little great. pun that i have um our first question comes from uh carrie kelly fans from all around the world have written in and uh we put these up i was only able to get a grab a handful of them this week um but thank you always for contributing uh, when we have it our first question is at bellingerp who's a former fan of the week which we will have our new fan of the week announced right after this um who was your inspiration to become the guitarist you are today you might have came up with that with the guy you said that uh, helped you with that was in uh that was yeah. he was in yeah, striper heard, and then yeah. out of striper yeah was yeah it, yeah the stri- striper stealer ingve thing you know i mean yeah he was definitely an inspiration um his name's kurt james great guitar player great guy but, you know, back then I was really into like Michael Shanker, you know, Uli Roth and, you know, trying to learn things like that. You know, it's that European kind of dealio. And then, you know, obviously Ingve was come blowing people's minds back then. And, you know, then you had the regular dudes when I was a kid, like, you know, obviously Ace Freely when I, I was like, didn't know whether the guy was great or not. But, you know, you love when you're seven years old, you go, well, look at this, this is incredible, you know. But Eddie Van Halen, there's so many great guitar players. But uh, I think when I really started trying to play it. And, and like I said, that, that guitar teacher that, that helped me in, in the beginning, the jazz, guy, jazz guy. Yeah. really turning me on to things that helped me, even though maybe I didn't want it to help me back then. Cause I'm like, Larry Carlton, this guy doesn't look fucking cool. You know what I mean? Or, <laughs> what or do you I'm, mean? I kind of look like Larry Carlton now yeah, <laughs> starting yeah. to <laughs> Al Di Miola, I mean, remember how he looked, dude, he was like 18 years old, but he had a full beard and yeah. the glasses. You're he, like, he went old not- early. That's what you do. Do you go old early, like Eric Clapton? You start dressing in a suit when you're 20s. So then, yeah. when like you know, when you're 60, you kind of look. Oh yeah, that's just Eric Clapton. Or you yeah. know, <laughs> so he went old early. That's what I call it. But isn't yeah. it funny how the names of our, our guitar teachers? You know, you say the jazz guy. My 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 teacher was Steve Phillips because he was the one that taught me Peter Frampton solos, and he taught oh, well. me, you know, he taught me some Rolling Stone songs and stuff. And he was in a band too. But he was my, you know first guitar teacher so yeah. th- th- those those uh, sort of what do you call them you know, the, the guys that inspire you yeah. from the beginning they, they really are your fucking heroes he would they yeah. were my, my my first guitar teacher was so yeah. um right. when you mentioned it's awesome dude we we were able to jam with him a few times actually in the bay area night ranger and peter he was he was very nice awesome guy that's Legend. amazing yeah well I know you, wh- you really like him speaking of Speaking of like Ingve, because you have some you have some guitar heroes that don't have, um, I would say, the easiest uh, reputation of being like you know the most approachable people. Have you ever met or have any stories about Ingve? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I've met him. I uh, uh, mean, a bunch of times. <laughs> He's a wild Is card. It- I sold him some gear one time. He was playing here in Orange County, and I had this uh, DC ten. It's like this weird old uh, Roland Echo. And uh, he knew that a I had rack one. Mount thing? Is that a little rack mount one? It's, it's not a rack mount, but it's like a box. It was like, you know, it's kind of like the size of a Bible or something, you know? And it it, it it does a certain sound that he would do this delay where kind of a sound that one didn't of his- have a chorus unit with it or did they have? Yeah, it's like that thing. So uh, 
one time he was playing here, I don't know, it was like 20 years ago, and he knew I had one, and apparently he was going to Japan like the next day or two, and his like was broke. So, you know, he called, I had to come down, and I sold it to him, and you know what I mean? I grinded him on the price a little bit, you know? <laughs> Isn't that? You grinded yeah. in there. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, he goes, yeah, man, I think, you know, they're worth like, uh, you know, 200 or something. I go, dude, the thing's you rare. Me? You know that. Yeah. I'm like, you got to give me four. <laughs> so then he, so I brought it down at the sound check and hung out. And then, and then he had his manager peeled me off the hundreds, you know. All right. All right. And you got to see rehearsal. I guess that was part, you know, you got to see Ingve yeah. rehearse. That was part of your pay. Yeah, weird. One, one time I, I was up at, at uh, member Leeds rehearsal studio in, in, yes, the, valley. in the valley. Yeah. yeah, and I went there because I, I knew the guys in the band uh, more than Ingve. this Jens and Anders. Jens is a keyboard player, and Anders, you know, the drummer. Let me um, guess, they're Swedish. Yeah, of course, <laughs> you know the name, yeah. Jens so, uh, and Anders. So I went, yeah, I, I went down to the studio the, the first day. He had Joe Lynn Turner coming uh, to audition, I guess. And so Joe came in a car, dropped off the airport. I just happened to be hanging out or whatever, so that was kind of a fun experience, you know. Wow. All right. I, I love Joe Lynn Turner. He's got some great stories as well. Oh, yeah. You know? He's a good guy. Yeah. Just make sure you get your tinfoil hat and put it on first before you hit the end of story time. It's great. <laughs> story <laughs> time. It's good ones. Right. There's some good ones there. But you know what, Joe? If you're watching this, maybe you'll be on the, in the trenches pretty soon because he's a good guy. Oh, At know. Robbie Lee Cooper's our next question. Uh, was there a moment or event and you said to yourself, hell yeah, music is what I want to do? Robert. Uh, yeah, man. It was just when I was, I don't know, I was a kid. I didn't know any different. You know, I just loved music. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, coming home from school when I was whatever it was, 12 years old and having, you know, Joey's band jamming, I was like, this is awesome. You know, I mean, I don't want to go go to school or do this or do that. And I, whatever it was, it just compelled me and I, and I liked it and I liked playing guitar. And, uh, you know, so I've seen very, Joey's band practice you know, inspired you to eventually take his job. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> he, he helped me out. It's like, I'll have that, please. <laughs> I love he's it. A great guy. I see him all the time and, and we have, he still lives, his parents still live there. Um, just right down the street from my parents and, and, uh, but he lives over in Anaheim and he's a great guy. Love that guy. Nice. Nice. Well, I, and I know that, uh, Eric, uh, has his wine company going. We love his wine. And, uh, Again, another guy that we need to get here in the trenches as well. Um, yeah. But I'm moving on, and this is this comes back to aces and nails because at Kathy Grant seven one six five three, because apparently there was seven one five six two was taken. Yeah. Um, how much do you get involved in developing new craft beers for Ace and Ales and your current favorite? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, we always do collaborations with various companies, you know, um, I've done a few with stone. I've done some with Lagunitas, um, uh, love Nate. Lagunitas. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, like great guys, um, Northern I'm, California. Yeah. Right? Dude, Petaluma up there up North, man. Um, yeah, I, I love doing it. No, I'm, I'm totally immersed in it and, and hands-on on the whole thing, whether it's, it's developing collaboration beers or, just the whole operation of aces, you know, it gives me something that <laughs> it occupies more of my time than, than music actually these days. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm into it, man. I love doing it. I think it's kind of cool. It's like, you know, let's try this hop or try that. And, you know, always throwing new things in. And like I said, it, it's a, it's a creative, you know, outlet kind of, and I think it's, it's neat and it's interesting. It's artistic, you know, I dude, there's no way that you could be on social media because if it, you don't have any more time left in the day <laughs> to actually be on there, because you'd be again if if you do it the way that you do things, 110 percent, you'd be on your phone all the time. You'd have you'd be one of those first guys that got the Elon chip put in your yeah. you know in your skull so that you could be. <laughs> yeah, plug, plug but, in. but you guys, you know, you have already been out there. You know, you're out there with Night Range. You're touring right now, um, so music is taking a lot of yeah, your uh, of your time, and and that's the great time. because yeah. you got this new record coming out. Um, tell me about the shows that are happening, uh, even in the last month. What's it like getting back out there after you know of all of us having such a long hiatus? Yeah, I mean, obviously the weirdest fucking time in in our history. You know, that's that's happened, but. Yeah. Uh, you know, we actually played a few shows during the pandemic and uh, they were awesome. I think we played like eight or nine shows and, and 
they were great, but lately we've been playing a lot and uh, people are having a blast. I mean, you know, we try to be safe and all that. We're not really doing the meet and greets and things like that, but uh, the shows have been sold out, you know, totally packed. There's me and Brad. That's a cool shot. Um, yeah. I think people are really, the people that want to come out and aren't worried about it are, are coming out full force and just going off, um, which has been great. And we have a, like 50 more shows, I think booked throughout the end of the year. I mean, they're just coming in. Are they all over the place? Are they, are you guys picking and choosing sort of the COVID laxed, rules like states or is it kind of just hit and miss it's kind of like we'll see what happens when we go there if, if, the, if they're going to be harsh lists or if it's going to be you know yeah real we're, tight we're kind, of, we're kind of just letting it rip man like i said dude i mean we're you know we're the band that plays sturgis dude in the middle of the you know ah <laughs> night ranger played sturgis yeah, there's like 50,000 people there at the whatever the, what was it? It's the Buffalo Chip. Is that what it's called there? Oh, the Buffalo <laughs> Chip. There. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. So we had a blast. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're just playing for the people, man. And everything's been good. I mean, we've got like shows in, in uh, Colorado this week. We're just in Louisiana. Uh, we are over there at the Surf Ballroom, you know, the famous Surf Ballroom. A couple oh, yeah. Of you know, oh, the yeah. Buddy Holly, of course, the last show, unfortunately. It's in Iowa, right? Yeah. Yeah, sort yeah. of legendary place. So yeah, dude, we're just going, we're just rolling with it, man. We're on the wave, you know. <laughs> it's rolling, you know. Just trying, to, just trying to stay one step ahead of it, man. Don't yeah, let it crash just, down well, on well, you, man. Well, what, what do you think? What are you guys doing, like uh, with the Alice? Well, we've got dates with Ace Freely, you know, lined up September, October. So you oh, know, cool. that's the thing. Oh, look you, at there's there's our dates right there, folks. If you can squint your eyes or you put your own readers on yourself, you can uh, see where we're playing, and hopefully we're playing in a town near you. Um, City. Cool. Start off there. When, huh? That's where we're kicking it off. Cool. Yeah. But how did you know? I'm gonna take a tiny uh, deviation from let the people speak. We're gonna get back to you, people. But uh, thank you very much for asking your questions. I'm getting back to you though. Um, how did the Night Ranger gig come up? come around because you that's been a pretty real stable gig yeah. for you and it, it's it's been a mainstay for for a number of years if we go back to that uh chart right there vic we'll see that uh that that, that does hold a, a, a quite a long uh list in, in the yeah. nice fuchsia color of years yeah. and it's up to today how did how did that audition come and did you get it was it one of those things like you mentioned earlier, was it like last minute? Like, hey, Gary, you got to learn Night Ranger set tomorrow. Or yeah. how did it go, how did it work out? It was similar to that, but uh, I'll just try to put it together really, really quick. Um, we are playing in Canada, dude. Uh, at what's it called, Rock the Park? That in London, you know that joint with uh, you know the guy who always does the shows with us up there, the promoter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, so, Rob so Jones. Who, who, who were you playing with? Yes, it was. Yeah. Jones. Yeah, yeah. So it was with Alice. You know, we were the, the main band, but like a couple of bands before, I don't know exactly what the lineup was, uh, Night Ranger was playing. Um, so we, you know, come down to the show at whatever time, five o'clock, you know, the regular Alice kind of thing. And uh, Damon had known Jack because Jack I guess played. at one point he was, they were going to try to do a damn Yankees thing, but Ted Nugent couldn't do it or something. I guess Damon was kind of involved. So he, he knew Jack somehow. So we came down to the show and then after they were done playing, um, me and Damon and Jack were kind of just talking and, you know, I met him. That was the first time I had met Jack. So this was whatever year it was, I don't know, 2006 or seven. And then one day I was out with, with John Waite, dude, it's the same exact story. And, and I was out getting some dinner. It was like on an we off just, day. Uh, hold on. I, we just hit the, uh, we're into the seventies now we've hit into the 70. Maybe we only have 70 bands to go folks, but John Waite is frigging amazing by the way. And is he on the list? Yes, he is on the list. I, I mean, such an amazing song, original singer from the babies. And yeah. I always love the fact that you play with John Waite. It was I, I just got, I, I was just on me and him were texting this morning. He's, er, I get up pretty early and he, we were saying, Oh, Look at, there we are. Yeah, he's yeah, he's a badass man. His voice is so fucking great. He doesn't tune down or anything. He's like, oh, when I gotta turn tune down, it's that's the end of it. Fuck it. Wow. He just like balls. No, he like, sounds like John. That's probably why live. He sounds exactly like John Wayne. Yeah. Sounds like those records, man. Look at that. I mean, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Okay. Well, so go so, back so, to, yeah. <laughs> from John Wayne to Night Ranger. Yeah, Night Ranger. Yeah. So, so I was sitting, getting some food. It was a day off on, on the John Waite show. And, uh, Jack called me 
out of out of nowhere, and he says, "Hey, uh, I was just talking to Damon, and uh, we need a guitar player for this Canada tour." And it's a, it was with Journey. They were doing like a three or four week Canada tour with Journey, opening for Journey. Can you do it? And I said, well, yeah, well, when is it or whatever? And it was like a week or so away. I can't remember exactly. It was like a week or 10 days away or something like that. And I go, yeah, I'd love to do it. That'd be awesome. He goes, yeah, are you into the stuff and whatever? I go, yeah, fuck. Let's, let, let's do it. You can still rock in America. Yeah, yeah of course. You yeah, can always rock yeah. in America. <laughs> so, uh, so obviously the guys, a lot of them live all over the place. So we really didn't have time to rehearse. The day before the show, I just flew up to Jack's house. And Jack had like a little studio. We jammed for about an hour. It was the keyboard player. We got, by the time we just got done, they said, oh, dude, you're, everything's fine, whatever. The keyboard player got there for about five minutes by the time he like set up. And then Jack just said, oh, we're done. Just forget about it. So he had drove all the way over. And then we were already, he said, forget it. So then like the next day, we just flew out and, ju and did the show. So it's just, wow. you know, I don't know. We and, did one then, show. One show was a solo show. The first show was was a Night Ranger, uh, whatever you know, headlining show, and then the Journey tour. The Journey, yeah. yeah. I mean, that is the perfect trifecta, actually. John Waite, uh, Night Ranger, Journey. It just yeah. sounds like the perfect. Well, and then of course, if you maybe I might add sticks in there. Yeah. You, yeah. you say there's a group of, of of your of that genre of bands that uh, tends to like stick together. Is is yeah. REO Speedwagon sort yeah. of put in that list as well? And yeah, man. Maybe we we just played with sticks last weekend. So yeah, the sticks we play with a lot. It's great. Um, you know, and like you said, REO dude, those guys are great, dude. I mean, Dave Amato on guitar, he has a killer guitar collection and vintage gear and stuff too. But yeah, mm -hmm. REO foreigner. We do a lot journey, of course, uh, you know, sticks, things like that fit very mm -hmm. well with, with Ranger. Of course. Of course. I could, I could also hear, well, I, I could also see possibly some Pat Benatar being thrown in there in the yeah. mix because, you know, Neil Gerardo is a big, oh, you know, uh, is, uh, that is another thing that I didn't even, it's not even in the script, David Rattenberry. And, I, and I'm not even thinking of it, but just because it's part of our history, we all played back in the day gmp guitars oh yeah you know yeah. And, and and you played a roxy model you played the roxy ss neil yeah. Geraldo from pat benatar's band played a roxy ss although he called it a spider but it was really a roxy ss and yeah. i'm really happy about that <laughs> yeah. and i think me you uh he, 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 he had a it's a spider because he had a five position switch aha <laughs> <laughs> he had an ivory pick guard. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, Neil Geraldo, who's one of my favorite guitar players, so I don't give a fuck if he want, doesn't want to say that he played my guitar and he played his own guitar. It's It was, you know, it's fine. And also Rick Springfield. I think, though, the four of us were were kind of nice. And, and, of course, I think Jerry Finn, the late, great Jerry Finn, owned one as well. They were yeah. good guitars, GMP. We love Cameron Moline. Yeah. We love GMP. Um you know, GMP guitars for me were, were they they gave me my first break as far as you know having a signature model and stuff like that. So I was I was very happy. Yeah, but I've always I, been a traditionalist as well. How did I don't even know the story? How how did that come about? Like how did you meet Cameron and the guys? I met Cameron and the guys when I was hanging out uh, rehearsing for a Gilby Clark tour. Because I was playing with Gilby Clark at that time. Yeah. And then at the same time, Gilby was playing in the first version of Snake Pit. Here's how it all comes around, dude. This is how incestuous. Guess where this rehearsal was at, folks? Guess where it was at? <laughs> Mate's <laughs> rehearsal. Mate's <laughs> rehearsal right in the valley with this shady, slim, shady character named Bobby running the whole show. But, uh, Cameron walks in. He says, "Look, I'm from San Dimas. I, I my, you know, my father owns a ju juicing company, but I own a guitar company, and we have a little small section there. And I think we make really good guitars. Uh, we'd like to make a guitar for you. Would you be into it?" And of course, you know, he's checking out. I think maybe, just maybe, I was the low hanging fruit at that point because <laughs> you know, because of course, me, I'm gonna want my own guitar. But maybe he's got his eye on the prize if, if, if like, maybe Gilby gets one or maybe yeah. Slash gets one. And, of course, you know, you got to yeah, yeah. you gotta sort of – that's that's the front of the cover. The, yeah. uh, and, and we actually appeared on the same album cover because uh, 
You're uh, you're on the back cover. I'm on the front cover. Vic, do you have the back cover as well? He's shaking his head no. See? No. But anyway, that's the GMP. That's And so he came to me, and they were always cool and always supportive. And then eventually, there it is. There's the back cover. Yeah. Um, then eventually what ended up happening is that GMP made a guitar for Gilby. And then I think Johnny Grippark, the bassist and slash the snake pit ended up playing them. The guys in Warren ended up playing uh, yeah. GMP, uh, CC DeVille. And of course you yourself, you, you have, you still have a few GMPs. Yeah, you. dude. I mean, I, I have all of them, but I think like 10 of them or something, 11, okay. I don't know exactly, but, and you know, the Warren guys, they, they're all still jamming them all the time. I mean, they, that's yeah. all they play that. still to yeah, this day. That's great. Yeah. That's great. I have I have a few of mine hanging in uh, the Hard Rock. So so, but I but they were really nice ones. I I hate it when people put a guitar, they sign a guitar at Hard Rock. And say, yeah, well, this is you know Neil Sean's guitar, and then you look at it, the headstock and you go, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> he just signed it. But yeah. but the ones that I have hanging are definitely they were on stage, they were on tour, they were played. So you know if you want to go break the glass and take it out of there, at least it'll, it'll be worth. You know, whatever GMP Roxy SS is worth these days. It'll be worth the jail time. <laughs> that is true. That's we're getting I, back I, to the people I, speak. I haven't seen we're gonna... Cameron for a while, but uh, if you if you if you ever talk to him, tell him I said hi. Cameron? Yeah. Of course, of course, yeah. We 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 you know we're we, Cameron and I. Uh, you know, we have this such a long history, and he's uh, he's still in San Dimas. So oh, yeah, I'll tell him okay. he said hi. Cool. Yeah, uh, for sure. So here we go. We're moving on, letting the people speak because I spoke way too much just now. <laughs> at at tarot.woman31750. This goes with, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough question, but do you have a favorite song to play? I will limit it to Night Ranger because that's the band at hand right now. Do you have a favorite Night Ranger song to play or a favorite song in general? Yeah, no, let's go with Night Ranger. And, and I think it's... Uh one of the coolest greatest songs you know and because the guitar shit is rad and uh is don't tell me you love me of course you know heavy tune you know it's an f sharp which is like you know one of my favorite keys you know it's kind of that f sharp is like the thin lizzy key yeah, you know, i was just gonna say dun, 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 dun. Yeah. it's a jailbreak yeah it's jailbreak yeah, right a lot, of, a lot of f sharp man I, I i love it yeah thin lizzy a lot of songs in f sharp and uh so and alice I just, cooper alice yeah. cooper go, go to hell f yeah. sharp yeah all right. Uh, <laughs> there, there's some cool priest songs in F sharp as well, I think. Oh yeah. 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 So F sharp is a great key as we know. See, it's the magical key for rock, but uh, you know, I just love the energy of that. Don't tell me you love me. We play it. You know, it's one of the songs towards the end of the set, you know, with the good old sister Christian, uh, but you know, there's all the fast guitar. Me and Brad are going nuts at the end, all the harmonies and it's, it's awesome. There he is. It's wasn't, my brother right there. Brad wasn't, Gale. Brad Gillis, and he's still playing. Go back to that picture. He's still playing because this kind of dovetails into the next question from uh, our good uh, at Phil Curry. Um, he's still playing that Red Strat. Uh, is that now? Does he play the original one that he had back in the Aussie days? Still to this day? Yeah, he has that original one, and also so back then they made his own, you know, whatever signature model. Brad Gillis model, yeah. For yeah, Fernandez. Um, Made, made them, but they only made like X amount of them. I think it was like 300 or something like that. So dude, he goes around collecting them, trying to, so he has a bunch of these Brad Gillis models. So he's either using those or he, he uses the original, which he still has. Yes. Right. So right. It's pretty rad. The thing was, I, I think that, uh, don't tell you me, don't tell me you love me was the lead single off the Dawn Patrol album. So it was the first yeah. single off the yeah. first album, yeah. and I remember that album well. But it was, it was, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, radar album, yeah, you got the, the you know, going up to the moon or whatever. Uh, what, what did you think about that, you know, being from up north? I mean, were you like, man, this is one of our bands, or, you know, yeah, when it, when, when they, they broke out, it was kind of like, Okay, fuck man. Not one guitar player that rips, but two. Oh yeah. You know? Because yeah. that was the thing. The 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 shoes you have to fill in filling Jeff Watson's shoes. As a lord, you know? yeah. I, I know that it, it it went through a couple I know that Holkstra uh, Joe Holkstra played for, for for a while as well. But but I mean the original Jeff Watson that yeah. with the eight finger technique, have you had to learn any of the eight finger technique, especially with rock in America solo, 
or do you just do you do your own version of that? Uh, I was kind of doing a different version in the beginning, kind of like an arpeggio thing. A fa- it was kind of like the same thing, but I kind of like do a, you know, my own little version of the tapping these days, which is, you know, I just do what, what I do, which is fine. It's part of the, yeah, it's part of the. Yeah, have, you, have you ever tried the, the, the eight? Because I actually tried the eight finger uh, yeah. technique for a while. It's fucking hard. I mean, oh, you, yeah, you think yeah. he, Eddie Van Halen with one finger doing the t- the tapping and stuff, but then Jeff Watson took it to another level with the eight fingers. And there was another uh, Los Angeles guitar player. Do you remember him um, in the band Autograph? Autograph. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember. Yeah. Um, I mean, I turn know up the, the radio. Uh, yeah. Steve. Come on, yeah. chat. Help Plunkett. me out. Who was a guitar player in Autograph? Plunkett was the singer. Steve, no, was Steve Lynch. Yeah, you- George Lynch's brother. It couldn't have been George Lynch's brother. Come on. (laughs) Really? (laughs) If it was, then that's a fucking talented family. No, but talk talk about the eight finger thing. Um, It's so strange when people use that term because Jeff never plays with eight. It's not eight. It's six. So it's like these two, you know, your index, you know, finger, these two on the, on the fretting and then those four. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's what it is. Yeah. Six finger. See, I don't, I don't know where how the eight thing came up because there's no song that he plays that, but uh, it sounds better. You know, if you ne- never let the truth get in the way of a good story, you know what I mean, dude? That's perfect because that's what we're getting on to next. But one more question before, because that's <laughs> actually you and I both know we've hung out with Alice Cooper enough to know never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But that's just mainstream media lying to you again, folks. It's not the eight string. It's not the eight finger technique. It's six string. It's fix, six yeah. finger technique. Um, this again wraps everything together with all the people who have spoken today. And thank you again for week in and week out putting in your questions. At Phil Curry asks, "Hey Carrie, can you please tell us about the rig you're currently using, your amps, your pedals, and etc.? Because we're talking about equipment, we're talking about technique. What is it that you're blasting out of these days? So it's pretty simple, man. And it's it's weird. I mean, I think." And maybe mean you could talk for a second, Rye. I'm playing like the same. Well, I, I'm playing Black Star amps uh, currently. I've been playing them for I don't know six, seven years, um, and they're great. Great, they treat me great. Great company, easy amps. They've never broke down, um, which is awesome. Uh, and then regular, you know, LP guitars, Les Pauls, or, or sometimes I have some other things out, but mainly LPs. But as far as pedals go. I have the same fucking pedals that that I used <laughs> when me and you used to play back in the nineties. Literally, it. it's just a chorus pedal. A uh, Boss CE2? Is it what? a CE? Is it a Boss CE2? Yeah. What uh, is your chorus? I it's don't know. Be what, a- I don't know which one I actually have right now. I have we have two different rigs: an A rig and a B rig. One's in okay. Phoenix. One's in. I can't remember, but but it's just a chorus pedal in general. Chorus pedal. And Color. Delay. And delay. Yeah. And the wah. Okay. That's it. What's your wah that are you using a crybaby or are you using? Because I'm I always use the bad horsey uh, when I use a wah. Yeah, that the was Morley. always my the morally bad horsey. That was his yeah, Steve Vai's model. Yeah, th- no, I got these new ones. Um, they came out about a year, couple years ago, and they brought me like five or six of these new ones. They're like, yeah, I try them out. So I've been using them, and they're and they're awesome. And which but ones are they? That which one? Which ones? Yeah. I don't, I don't know exactly what they're called. They just brought them and said, Hey, try these. You know, they're like, is it, somewhere it's Morley though. Signature, yeah. Morley, some signature ones from, from different, might've yeah. been a new Steve I one or ever. I can't really remember, but, uh, does um, yours, but, are they self activated or is it like a, uh, yeah. it, for those of you that we're, we're, we're getting a little bit gear geeking out, gear headed out. That's okay. Don't, don't be afraid. Come to the gear heads. <laughs> Here we are. But it, the uh, Crybaby has that, you know, Slash always has been a, a, a Crybaby fan. So you have to like, you know, push it on all the way down before oh, it turns man. on. These are yeah. self-activated. That's yeah. the ones that I, that I dig on, you know? There yeah. There's your, there's your, there's our pal. Um, so all, all the same, what do you use for a boost yeah. to boost the uh, solos and stuff? I, or do you I don't. sound guy? I just play the rhythm channel. It's, <laughs> I try to play pretty clean, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? Like would not, Brad's sound is more gainy. Um, and mine is, is kind of more clean. I, I just don't even hit the, I don't use a gain or nothing. I just, what? so it's that simple. It's literally, I just play the one channel chorus pedal. And the only time you play the chorus pretty much is like, if you're playing a, a clean part, you know, 
then mm -hmm. you have to put a delay on for the solo just to get a little bit of vibe. And then sometimes the the hit the wall just for to fuck around basically. Oh. But you know, so th it's the same stuff I've been using since since I was a kid. You know, I don't like to have too many fucking buttons and like you said with the wah. Dude, because I would push the thing down and I tried to turn it off and then, the, you know, the treble's on 10 and then you're shit, you know. Well, I just figured you being such a uh, big Shanker fan and Uli Roth and stuff, you, you'd like that crybaby where you set it somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and cost, that's, yeah, yeah that, that, that's a that's a nice tone uh, sort of. On its know. own, yeah. But it yeah. isn't, a, you know, going to, to Shanker, for instance, you know, and like I said, at Night Ranger, I mean, I, I love bands, whoever the band may be. I mean, uh, fucking... 311, for instance, I know we're off on a different subject, but you know, that guy has like, you know, different patches for the pre-chorus and the verse and the chorus and the bridge. I mean, it sounds incredible, but you know, for a band, whatever, like Slash or Alice or Night Ranger or whatever, it's more of the straight in, you know, straight Michael Shanker, Michael Shanker plays wah into the Marshall. He's been doing it for 50 years. It's, you know, so that's what I go with kind of, you know? What's well, cool that as far as amplifiers, you're rocking the Black Star. I, I've been rocking, you know, ever since the pandemic, I, I was approached by Hughes and Kentner. And because I have done a lot of stuff online and I've been doing a lot of streaming and I've done the uh, the whole guitar um, System 12 course as well, um, I've been using this thing called the Black Spirit 200, which is a floor model, but it's everything's inclusive, a 200-watt amp that fits on the floor. So it, 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 and it has all the, the effects that I need built in. But what are the effects that I need? Echo and chorus. That's basically it, you know? Yeah, exactly. That, I mean, like I said, for these bands, that you know, whatever, Alice, Night Ranger, Slash, or whatever, you don't need fucking all this other. You have all those options, but when, when it really comes down to it, I just need to, you know, I said the best sound you can get is, you know, a good guitar through a pretty loud amp and as much stuff, as little stuff yeah, to mess yeah. with that is, is possible, you yeah. know? Well, yeah, so, I mean, the other, like I said, I mean, I would be hitting buttons and I'd, you know, leave it on or whatever. I just want the least amount of fucking hassle, you know? So that's yeah. what works for me. You know, it's good. That's good. Are, man. are you doing all your own switching and everything? Um, yeah, I am. But, but, but like I said, I only have oh, four different switches. Yeah. That's it. You know, yeah. I, and, and the only other song that I have some crazy effects for, at least on the last tour, you know, that we did, and I'm sure we're going to be doing that song again, <laughs> dead babies. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like a Halo Flies type of sound, but it's like that uh, vibrato -y sound that's uh, that's with uh, Dead Babies. And mm. um, that that's sort of a, a unique patch. But yeah. other than that, it would just mostly be three then. So it's yeah. a little three, th three, four, five patches. That's it. You know, yeah. I know that you could switch through the pre-chorus. It has the technology that you can that you could switch on every beat if you wanted to. But, you know, then I'd have to have someone that that. Uh, you know, hands not only hands me guitars, not only hands me a drink, but he yeah. also has to do all the foot switching for me too. And that's just yeah. way too much to ask for your guitar yeah. tech. They should, as long as they hand you a cold beer or a cold drink, then I think then they've done their job. And in a guitar that's in tune. That's what I was gonna say, in tune. Speaking <laughs> of which, I had a question. I know we're getting off. Dude, we could talk for freaking hours. Yeah, that's why we're gonna have another. We're gonna have another part, folks. I've seen the request already in the chat. Uh, Steve Lynch was the guitar player in question that had a uh, two hand two technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Carrie Kelly uh, dis diffused the rumor. It's a six finger technique, not eight finger technique, but um, yeah, we're going to have a, a part two, is, but what were you going to go off? What tangent are we going saying, off on? I, I know that you were uh, helping the, the Gibson back whenever 10 years ago or something like that, or working with them. Those, and I was talking to somebody at Sweetwater the other day. Are they still using the new guitars with those tuning, the automatic tuning things, or no, they do not. No, that was that. That was uh, almost like a previous owner type of thing that they've kind of moved on from. You're talking about the G Force and all it's, the it's, it's uh, tuned automatically or something, right? Yeah, and I have one of them. I, I, I have a few of them. Uh, it's a perfect guitar that I have when I want to learn any sort of song when I'm just jamming at home. It's a perfect apartment house guitar. Yeah. Um, Yes, you can play for it live, but then again, you do have a guitar tech. That's the reason why we have a guitar tech, and it, and it makes things a lot easier. Yeah. And the technology, I think, it's it's hard to incorporate, like moving moving strings and this precision instrument 
together because, you know, ultimately guitar is a feel type of thing. I, I, have you ever checked out those ever tuned bridges that never go out of tune? You can have a guitar that has perfect intonation, never goes out of tune. Tommy, uh, Tommy Hendrickson, guitarist for Alice Cooper, he, he plays them. He swears by it. But there's only one thing I have to question is when you bend, it sort of starts going back in tune while you're bending. So you have to uh, you almost overcompensate for your bending. So I don't. Oh, yeah. So so it sounds. But the guitar, honestly, he puts that 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 bridge. It's called the Evertune. Never goes out of tune. So I mean, I know I know we're get, we're given like like free advertisement, and our producers are going crazy. What are you giving free advertisement for these companies? Don't worry about it, folks. We're gonna well, we're gonna survive. I, we're just I, turning I, on people to new stuff. I, I, that, that would totally fuck me up if after playing for 40 years to have to, like you said, compensate yeah. one way or the other. That sounds, but I mean, I, I love the tuning being in tune aspect, but I don't know about it. Never the, dude. It, he, like Tommy will fly on a flight, go across, go across the, the fucking continent. He'll, he'll land. He'll just take the guitar out of the tune. Perfect. Perfectly in tune. Wow. Um, I think, I think the G forces, Oh, there's, there's a Tom. picture. I don't know for, for there's a picture of Tommy. That's why Vic put it up. I'm going, why did Vic just put up a picture of Steven Tyler and Carrie? But there it is. There's you and Carrie Kelly, uh, you and Steven Tyler being best friends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, I think the G force idea was mm -hmm. that they didn't want to have you spend time tuning your guitar. They'd rather have you time just playing the guitar. Yeah. And I and I love that idea. And like I said, it, it's really useful for me when I'm trying to go on YouTube and, and I say, I want to learn this guitar part. Oh, now it's he's he's tuned down to, you know, half step down. Well, I've yeah. got a guitar that's in, you know, standard tuning. Well, I just hit a hit a button without yeah. having to stretch it. It goes right away. So I'm 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 really happy with that. But again, cool. um yeah, I you was know, wondering I, about that. Like I said, I was talking to a Sweetwater guy the other last week, and uh, and I knew you. Yeah, they, they they moved on. They, they're much more traditional now. They're going back to to, to traditions, and and honestly, oh. Gibson has always uh, treated us right, and they've always been uh, great. That we have Robert Schalk that's working over at the um, was it the Tom Murphy Lab now. And he's he's yeah. putting up a bunch of cool guitars, and he's he's uh, uh, retroing them and relicing them. But there, I mean, there's so many great guitar companies and obviously yeah. gibson's one of my favorites I'm, I'm, I'm a mainstay and i'm getting to my question but i i mean i gotta throw some some credit out to uh billy rowe from rock and roll relics as well because i think he's making great guitars um i think palermo makes great guitars they made my strat uh, you know as well as um like Pardo guitars which made a, a new telly that i'm bringing out so you know i'm i'm, I'm just going finding Good looking guitars that play well as 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 well. But uh my question to you about yes. one of your strats, or not, not one of your strats, one of your Les Pauls. There's a picture of it in it you need to talk about never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. Uh there it is. That looks like a Les Paul Gold Top uh deluxe, if I if I will. Yeah. What is the RF on the sticker? stand for that rat and the sticker below what are those that well the one down below it i put that little circle one on that's uh <laughs> this go back to the picture o obey yeah down there which is uh my friend shepherd fairy you know he did that andre the giant does all that kind of obey artwork o uh, obey propaganda so i just put that on myself but obey uh, yeah, yeah yeah i've seen that. Uh, that you know that guy that does that artwork yeah yeah shepherd he's awesome yeah him and his <laughs> wife and what is the rf uh, rat what is that so that was put on there by the original owner, which is uh, Mike Ness from Social Distortion. Get out of here. So that's a Southern California go. Can we go back what, to that picture real what, quick? I know. Did the, I don't know why I just want to have show that Warren picture. County legend. That's, that's one of Mike Ness's guitars, 69 gold top. Wow. And how did you acquire that guitar? Uh, from his guitar tech. Um they just, for some reason, I mean, Mike is a big collector of vintage stuff. You know, that's kind of like the social distortion uh, deal or whatever. And he was just selling a couple guitars and we just picked it up. Well, there it is. We just figure out the mystery too. It's Rat Fink. Yeah. So Rat Fink. Uh, we're going to have to have Mike Rat Fink on the podcast now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Get Mike Ness on here, man. Come on. That would be great. That I'll would be lives. great. But dude, we could talk all night, but we're gonna we're gonna we're sort of slowly winding winding things down. It's night for me, it's morning for you. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate everyone that's been tuning in um all episode long. In fact, 
one particular person that uh, is awarded our fan of the week. Every week we do it. We have a in the trenches fan of the week, and this week is no different. Vic, will you run? Fan of the week is uh, Ryan May. Moss Guy. It's Moss Guy. How you doing, Moss Guy? Uh, Moss Guy actually put up a Brian May post this week because Brian May, we have this thing called the Roxy Guitar Armory, the Rock RGA. And if you want to start learning guitar, it's System 12. We start this thing called the Roxy Guitar Army. Brian May put out the Bry Army this last week to promote his new solo album that's coming out. Um, it's so weird that his guitar players would have things like the Army. I've never heard of any other band or guitar players having something Army. Have you? I guess uh, I guess Kiss started it, huh? <laughs> The kiss definitely started it. You know, well, what was you? What what is your sort of fan base? What do you call it? The you know, what what are what are the Carrie Kelly fan base? What is it called? I I don't know. <laughs> Come on, you must have some sort of. I really don't. rebellion. I, I never. Yeah, it's you know, beer drinkers and hell raisers. You know, I'm going back to ZZ Top. Of course, we, we, of played, course. We, we played with them as well. Night Ranger and ZZ, they were like on one of the first tours. I guess the Night Ranger tours was with ZZ back in the day. So they uh, knew the guys and I was able to meet them a few times. And uh, actually one time I was with Slash and we were at the El Compadre and uh, and Billy was there and he came over and sat with us and was hanging out. It was pretty fun. But, but we could tell stories forever, as we know. Right. But, but the thing is, I, I, I that was, we do want to pay tribute because it's been a fucking really rough couple of weeks for rock and roll with, you know, Jeff passing away, and then we had Dusty this week, and um, you know Jeff Labar from Cinderella, who I'm sure you, were you ever in Cinderella? No. <laughs> okay, okay. There's no, one band no. that did not make the list. All but right. there's a guy, yeah, I know it. And then, dude, you know Joey from Slipknot as well. Uh, of course, yeah. Fuck, dude, we actually played a, about a month or so ago in in his uh, town, and and I called him and I sent him a message, and he never got back with me for whatever reason. And then now this. I'm, it's kind of uh, bummed. He was always a good, well, good, good guy to me, but uh, I had heard about you know I heard the news about Dusty, and I was I, I felt I felt bad, and I was like, man, you know what? You put out such great music over the years, and I just I didn't think of so much about it. And then I then a couple days later, I was like, because I've, I've met Billy before through the Gibson job, and and you know I've watched ZZ Top a few times. I think that you know really had a, a really good time watching their concert uh, a couple years ago. And uh, it was here in Europe and stuff. But then I remember, I was like, shit, I've actually not just hung out with Dusty. We jammed schools out one night. I actually taught him schools out before we jam went up and jammed. And he learned it, you know, he's like, he was super fun to jam with. And he, he got it down. He's like, it's an E, right? E. And just jammed on that E and stuff. Hello. So it was, it, was an, it was one of those, you know, impromptu Alice Cooper jams where, you know, if someone from a band comes up and, uh, you know, they they they're a fan of Alice because yeah, pretty much everyone that that's yeah. is a fan of Alice. He's an iconic guy. They say, "Hey man, Alice goes invite him up for schools out if he knows how to play it." And he goes, "Yeah, you know how to play it." And every single one of them says the same thing. Of course I know it. Yeah, of course sure. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the easiest stuff to jam on a Cooper song, right? You you you've played with Alice Cooper. You've had a bunch of people come up and jam with you. It's. Alice Cooper songs are not the easiest songs to jam. They have a lot of little changes in it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, especially on that, like you said, I mean, and, and I know there's always a slight different versions that you're doing. Like, I mean, before uh, or lately, I think, are you still doing the the Pink Floyd version or whatever? We have been since, yeah. I think, uh, ever, ever, ever since Bob Ezrin uh, said, hey, I like that idea because I produced both of them. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 yeah so then when you go when you go like hey man you know we're gonna do schools out it's pretty simple on the record but our version is twice as long and then there's a break and then there's fucking another brick in the wall and then it goes and don't forget the intros <laughs> yeah and then it goes to f sharp so wait you know whatever it may be but uh that's great but you know hey i gotta tell you a a, a, a queen story as well just because you, know, you mentioned brian may of course so, brian may, the bri, you know, the bri parents, army yeah my parents were really into music you know my dad played bass he was into like he was into zz top like power blues zz top the johnny winter stuff things like that rolling stones of course but uh queen in 19 
77 was my first concert dude at the forum my mom took me i was like six news of the world yeah had to have been news of the world yes. because that's that's when news of the world came out yeah, yeah dude so how rad is that fucking great i didn't yeah. know what it really was you know i know the records at the house you know you're a little kid but then you go to the forum you're just like this you know you're three foot high and see all these people, 20,000 people. You're like, what the fuck? You so, went to your first concert before I did, just so you know, because right. my first concert, I think, wasn't until maybe it was the same year. Maybe it was late 78, early seven, or late 77, early 78. It was the Jackson five, though, which is pretty cool as well. Yeah. And they were they were uh, working off the dancing machine album. But so I was Northern Cal. You were you were Southern Cal and you were seeing Queen. Of course, that's a better that's a better story. Damn yeah. It. <laughs> thanks my, you know, like I said, it's really thanks to my parents, obviously. Always good parenting. I didn't yeah. know, really, besides the record. You know, we're going to go to a concert. I'm like, and then we went to see Kiss like the next year um, or the year and a half later. It was on the Dynasty Tour. It was when all the guys were still in the band before I think Peter got kicked out first, maybe then Ace. And that was like a whole nother spectacle. I'm like walking around going, what the? This is nuts. Oh, look at this. <laughs> There's Eric. <laughs> yeah, that's you and Singer. Yeah. There you go. I love it. Oh, um, yeah, we could keep going forever. We barely scratched the surface. Holy we shit. We barely scratched the surface, folks. We only made it down, not even not even uh, past the dermis, I would say, of all the bands. Uh, we'll go one last uh, shot at this uh list of all the bands that we get to go through next time we have Carrie Kelly on as a guest because we are going to wrap things up and we are going to close with one more hype of the new album and the band played on uh, Night Ranger coming out right now, folks. It might be out as you're listening to this and you're telling more and more people about it. Uh, but Carrie, tell us about how the name of the album came about and uh, what are the plans for at least the next couple months? Yeah, well, Jack came up with the with the name and it was basically just, you know, in, during this lockdown thing, I, it was appropriate. You know what I mean? It was, we just didn't, just shut down and not do anything. We literally made a friggin' record, you know, and uh, even though it was kind of a weird way to do it because everybody's kind of working at their houses, you know, doing their own parts. But uh, actually Jack and I are the only people that got together. I went up to Jack's house for like a week and we kind of really got honed it in on all the arrangements and everything. And everybody kind of worked on their own parts, but uh, you know, we just did it. And then, so they, and the band played on during the pandemic and we played on, like I said, we played eight or nine or 10, shows during it and uh and we are safe nobody got sick at least in our camp and the people had a good time and that's what i think is awesome man so, music people like to have a good time man i know you're not a huge social media guy but we do have some websites to put at, to put out and uh we can talk about how to get in touch with uh yeah. the new single it's uh and of course aces and nails which is uh not just uh the original aces and nails location but there's three now and uh if you haven't heard about the uh, possible sushi joint uh go back and listen to the rest of the episode but uh for now you can check out at ace and nails ace aces and ales on instagram at aces and ales on facebook as well as carrie kelly dot carrie and of course and the band played on night ranger.com our guest today has been Carrie Kelly uh, of insert band name here. We will get to the second uh, 70 uh, in after on our next episode, but next week we will have a, a New York special with our guest, uh, Nikki Camp, because we're going back to the East Coast. Nikki Camp, um, legendary club promoter, and uh, from that picture, I'll say he plays guitar. Um, he'll be our guest next week on In the Trenches, but Carrie... Thanks again for dropping by. We're going to have you on again. It's it's definitely uh, been too long since we've been able to talk. Uh, yeah. Any any sort of you've said a lot of inspiring stuff, but anything that you can leave our audience with that uh, you sort of rules to live by or what inspires you and that you can pass on to our fans and crowd. Yeah, man. It's you know, I mean, I, I think that uh, I kind of live music for me i mean you can't take that away man it's i just love performing i know you do as, as well and and entertaining people and it's just such a great feeling and, and, I, and i'm so happy that i've been able to do it for the last well my whole life but i mean kind of professionally i guess the last 25 years and, and making people happy and it makes me happy too that's one thing uh like you said you can't you can't take that away that live experience and uh i'm looking forward to it this weekend in colorado and uh 
that's it. Like I said, I'm sure you can concur with me yeah. Ryan, on that. Well, after talking with you, I realize, you know, there is no substitute for hard work and you put the work in and that's why you enjoy the success that you have. And uh, we will hopefully cross paths very, very shortly. Uh, we will as soon as uh, yeah. I'm going to close out the show, but we'll talk a little bit more after that. But uh, hopefully we'll see each other on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll see. I don't know what you guys are doing on your rehearsal plans, but if you're around, like come down and see you guys. Before yeah, we'll, we'll have to check out each other's uh, tour schedule. Again, we start on the East Coast with Alice um, September, October. That's with Ace Fraley. And it looks like the first show is uh, September 17th, Atlantic City, New Jersey. So start wow. checking out the websites. Check out AliceCooper.com, RyanRocks.com, CarrieKelly.com, uh, uh, and, of course, NightRanger.com. And, of course, tell a friend about what uh, you just seen or what you've just uh listen to and again thanks for being a part of in the trenches i'm ryan roxy i've been with carrie kelly until next time enjoy the ride folks in the trenches with ryan roxy